So as I was saying, uh, the features on these uh, polymers are, are usually not sharp peaks like they would be with a perfect crystal like uh, say sodium chloride or say the crystal structure of, of copper metal. Uh, but from this uh, pattern you can still back out some characteristic distances, uh, usually peak distances, that uh, you can use to describe um, the dynamics of that uh, that system and so this picture uh, really highlights that so we would expect all these uh, individual dots if we had a single crystal very well-defined peaks if we're dealing with an unoriented uh, semi-crystalline material you usually get these halos or these rings and so what you do is you determine that central position measure uh, the distances of each of the rings and then based on the distance from the sample to the target you can then define uh, the angle uh, at which that ring is coming off of the sample and from that you can calculate the original spacings in that um, initial sample that initial material so it's a it's a useful technique for getting quantitative spacing measurement that's in a sub -micro microscopic um, area so here's what a, an angle scan might look like um, and from the, the angles the positions of these peaks you can then as I said get the um, spacings of that polymer system in the crystalline state so uh, we've looked at some micrographs but I just wanted to highlight them uh, again here and so optical microscopy especially polarized light optical microscopy which is, is like what's shown here uh, you can see these very definite domains. This is a very highly crystalline polymer. You see that there's not the uh, amorphous regions. These sphere lights have grown into each other, so we have kind of a grain structure. It basically is a grain structure of that uh, polymeric material. Um, this really highlights uh, a very typical appearance of crystalline polymers, and that is the, the Maltese cross pattern. Uh, Maltese cross was an um, um, insignia that, uh, if I remember correctly, was used by the, the German um, Air Force back in World War I, for instance. Um, and that pattern does s sort of show up in the uh, spherulite uh, appearance. You see that uh, Maltese cross pattern that just repeats in the... In, in every one of these crystalline domains and so that is usually a confirmation of a very high uh, percent crystallinity in your polymer film if you're doing optical microscopy especially polarized light microscopy we've looked at a few electron micrographs too but you get to zoom in and see more detail uh, and so I'm not sure but I think that this would be crystalline and then amorphous and crystalline and amorphous and uh, you see how that pattern repeats as we move through that sample. Atomic force microscopy is a, a third technique that gives you topographical information and so the way this uh, works is there's a, a cantilever that has a, a sharp uh, point and that is then uh, tapped along the surface and kind of rastered back and forth over the surface and from the deflection of that tip you can actually get topography and so this is like a topographical map of the surface and so you actually see that there is uh, some height difference uh, when moving from that interstitial region to the, the peak in that nucleated site and so there actually is topography imparted onto the surface of that polymer by the crystalline domains another method would be a DSC and so you can uh, observe uh, various transitions so uh, we've got the glass transition temperature which uh, heat flow remember uh, exotherms can be plotted either up or down um, and so you always have to kind of orient your your mind to the, the plot that you're you're working on um, you see for some reason this one actually has two different melting peaks it must be uh, a biphasic material, a block polymer, or a blend of some sort. Um, but if this is our uh, our melting peak, we could integrate the area under that peak uh, 
and then get some quantitative information about the, um, the degree of crystallinity. Uh, so from this, you can actually get a percent crystallinity. If we can't have some theory or some um, way to predict the percent, or the amount of uh, the, the size of the area under that um, that melting peak, and if we compare that with um, compare that with what is experimentally determined then you can get a, a percentage of that material that was crystalline versus amorphous. So in other words, if you know that the heat of fusion of polystyrene, or not polystyrene, I guess atactic, uh, or syndiotactic polystyrene was whatever, and then you calculate the mass of your material and you figure out how big that area could be if the sample was entirely crystalline, and then we found, well, we only had 50% of that area represented in our sample, then you could say that 50% of the polymer chains are involved in a crystalline domain and 50% must not be. They're involved in just the amorphous interstitial region. And so from this uh, technique, you can get quantitative uh, data uh, on the percent crystallinity of a particular uh, sample. Uh, another way is through density, and so composite density um, is uh, it, it can be a little bit confusing because it's not just simply an, a simple average between two different densities. You have to uh, take into account the uh, the percent of the material, and then it's you have to use this this inverse uh, equation in order to properly uh, treat um, your two densities to to get a the real answer. So in this equation you've got your polymer sample, mass of component 1, mass of component 2. So if we go back to that cartoon, say that's our sample, uh, we've got these crystalline domains uh, that are here in the polymer. Uh, we've got two domains, crystalline and amorphous, which is all the other um, interstitial material. And so um, you'd have to know the mass of the crystalline domains and the mass of the amorphous domains, the density of the two. Uh, and so we don't know all the things we need to for this equation to begin with. Um, if we uh, first measure the, the sample density, uh, you can do that with a, a specific gravity type measurement. So let's say you take your, uh, your polymer sample, you suspend that from a, a balance on a string, we put that in a beaker of a liquid of known um, of known density. You can measure the weight of the material in air, and then submerge it in the liquid and measure the weight when it's submerged. And then, because we know the density of the liquid, we can back calculate uh, the density of the sample. This is called specific gravity. It's a technique that we we did use back in Chem 135, uh, but to explain the variables, that's our sample density, density of air, density of our liquid, weight of the sample in air, weight of the sample in liquid. You throw it into the simple equation, you get your sample density. Uh, then, because the density of amorphous and crystalline components of, of polymers are known, you could use a tabulated uh, table of data that, that could then uh, be used, that we could put our experimental density in and um, put in our amorphous polymer density, our crystalline density, amorphous again, and solve this equation times by 100% and you get the percent crystallinity. Uh, hopefully, if this was a really critical thing for you to determine, you could do both the, the density measurement as well as the DSC, and hopefully your two uh, techniques would, would agree. Uh, and usually they, they do. So I think that's where we'll end for this chapter. Uh, and, so, and so that concludes the supermolecular structure uh, lecture.